Section thirty seven of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty four. What's that? rapped out Cleek, sitting up sharply. His interest had been trapped, just as Mr. Narkom knew that it would. Vanished from a glass room into which people were looking at the time, and yet nobody saw the manner of his going, do you say? That's it, precisely. But the most astonishing part of the business is the fact that whereas the porter can bring at least three witnesses to prove that he showed the boy into that glass room, and at least one to testify that he heard him speak to the occupant of it, the two watchers who were looking into the place at the time are willing to swear on oath that he not only did not enter the place, but that the room was absolutely vacant at the period, and remained so for at least an hour afterward. If that isn't a mystery that will want a bit of doing to solve, dear chap, then you may call me a Dutchman. Hmm, said Cleek reflectively. How then am I to regard the people who give this cross testimony as lunatics or liars? Neither, begad, asseverated Narkom emphatically. I'll stake my reputation upon the sanity and the truthfulness of every mother's son and every father's daughter of the lot of them. The porter who says he showed the boy into the glass room I've known since he was a nipper. His dad was one of my yard men years ago. And the two people who were looking into the place at the time, and who swear that it was absolutely empty and that the lad never came into it. Look here, old chap. I'll let you into a bit of family history. One of them is a distant relative of Mrs. Narkom. An aunt, in fact, who's rather down in the world and does a bit of dressmaking for a living. The other is her daughter. They are two of the straightest living, most upright and truly religious women that ever drew the breath of life, and they wouldn't either of them tell a lie for all the money in England. There's where the puzzle of the thing comes in. You simply have got to believe that that porter showed the boy into that room, for there are reliable witnesses to prove it, and he has no living reason to lie about it. And you have got to believe that those two women are speaking the truth when they say that it was empty at that period, and remained empty for an hour afterward. Also, if you will take on the case and solve at the same time the mystery attending the disappearance of both father and son, you will have to find out where that boy went to, through whose agency he vanished, and for what cause. A tall order, that, said Cleek, with one of his curious one-sided smiles. Still, of course, mysteries which are humanly possible of creation are humanly possible of solution, and there you are. Who is the client? Miss Larue? If so, how is one to be sure that she will not again call a halt and spoil a good case before it is halfway to completion? "'For the best of reasons,' replied Narkom earnestly. "'Hers is not the sole say in the present case. "'Added to which, she is now convinced that her suspicions in the former one were not well grounded. "'The truth has come out at last, Cleek. "'She stopped all further inquiry into the mysterious disappearance of her brother, "'because she had reason to believe that the elder Mr. Trent had killed him "'for the purpose of getting possession of those jewels "'to tide over a financial crisis "'consequent upon the failure of some heavy speculations upon the stock market. "'She held her peace and closed up the case "'because she loves and is engaged to be married to his son.' and she would have lost everything in the world sooner than hurt his belief in the honour and integrity of his father. What a ripping girl! Gad, but there are some splendid women in the world, are there not, Mr. Narkom? What has happened, dear friend, to change her opinion regarding the elder Mr. Trent's guilt? 
the disappearance of the son under similar circumstances to that of the father and from the same locality she knows now that the elder mr trent can have no part in the matter since he is at present in america the financial crisis has been safely passed and the son who could have no possible reason for injuring the lad who is indeed remarkably fond of him and by whose invitation he visited the building is solely in charge and as wildly anxious as man can be to have the abominable thing cleared up without delay he now knows why she so abruptly closed up the other case and he is determined that nothing under heaven shall interfere with the prosecution of this one to the very end it is he who is the client and both he and his fiancee will be here presently to lay the full details before you here cleek leaned forward in his chair with a sort of lunge as he flung out the word and there was a snap in his voice that fairly stung good heavens above man they mustn't come here get word to them at once and stop them it wouldn't be any use trying i'm afraid old chap i expect they are here already at all events i told them to watch from the other side of the way until they saw me enter and then to come in and go straightway to the public tea-room and wait until i brought you to them well of all the insane whatever prompted you to do a madman's trick like that a public character like miss larue a woman whom half london knows by sight who will be the target for every eye in the tea-room and the news of whose presence in the hotel will be all over the place in less than no time were you out of your head good lad i i thought i'd be doing the very thing that would please you dear chap bleated the superintendent despairingly it seemed to me such a natural thing for an actress to take tea at a hotel that it would look so innocent and open that nobody would suspect there was anything behind it and you always say that things least hidden are hidden the most of all cleek struck his tongue against his teeth with a sharp clicking sound indicative of mild despair there were times when mr narkom seemed utterly hopeless well if it's done it's done of course and there seems only one way out of it he said nip down to the tea-room as quickly as possible and if they are there bring them up here it's only four o'clock and there's a chance that valdemar may not have returned to the hotel yet heaven knows i hope not he'd spot you in a tick in a weak disguise like that then why don't you go down yourself and fetch them up old chap he'd never spot you lord your own mother wouldn't know you from adam in this spiffing get-up and it wouldn't matter a tinker's curse then if valdemar was back or not it would matter a great deal my friend don't deceive yourself upon that point for one thing captain maltravers is registered at the office as having just returned from india after a ten years absence and ten years ago miss margaret larue was not only unknown to fame but must still have been in pinafores so how is he to have made her acquaintance then too she doesn't expect to see me without you so i should have to introduce myself and stop to explain matters yes and even risk her companion getting excited and saying something indiscreet and those are rather dangerous affairs in a public tea-room with everybody's eyes no doubt fixed upon the lady no you must attend to the matter yourself my friend so nip off and be about it if the lady and her companion are there just whisper them to say nothing but follow you immediately if they are not there slip out and warn them not to come look sharp the situation is ticklish and just how ticklish mr narkom realized when he descended and made his way to the public tea-room for the usual four o'clock gathering of shoppers and sightseers was there in full force the well-filled room was like a hive full of buzzing bees who were engaged in imparting confidences to one another the name of margaret larue was being whispered here there and everywhere 
and all eyes were directed toward a far corner where at a little round table margaret larue herself sat in company with mr harrison trent engaged in making a feeble pretence of enjoying a tea which neither of them wanted and upon which neither was bestowing a single thought narkom spotted them at once made his way across the crowded room said something to them in a swift low whisper and immediately became at once the most envied and most unpopular person in the whole assembly for miss larue and her companion arose instantly and leaving some pieces of silver on the table walked out with him and robbed the room of its chief attraction all present had been deeply interested in the entire proceeding but none more so than the tall distinguished-looking foreign gentleman seated all alone at the exactly opposite end of the room from the table where miss larue and her companion had been located for his had been the tensest kind of interest from the very instant mr narkom had made his appearance and remained so to the last even after the three persons had vanished from the room he continued to stare at the doorway through which they had passed and the rather elaborate tea he had ordered remained wholly untouched a soft step sounded near him and a soft voice broke in upon his unspoken thoughts is not the tea to monsieur's liking it inquired with all the deference of the continental waiter and that awoke him from his abstraction yes quite thank you by the way that was miss larue who just left the room was it not philippe yes monsieur the great miss larue the most famous of all english actresses so i understand and the lame man who came in and spoke to her who is he not a guest of the hotel i am sure since i have never seen him here before i do not know monsieur who the gentleman is it shall be the first i shall see of him ever it may be however that he is a new arrival they would know at the office if monsieur le baron desires me to inquire yes do i fancy i have seen him before find out for me who he is philippe disappeared like a fleet shadow after an absence of about two minutes he came back with the desired intelligence no monsieur le baron the gentleman is not a guest he announced but he is visiting a guest the name is yard he arrived about a quarter of an hour ago and sent his card into captain maltravers who at once took him up to his room captain maltravers so that will be the military officer from india will it not yes monsieur the one with the fair hair and moustache who lunched to-day at the table adjoining monsieur le baron's own ah to be sure and pass the time of day with me as they say in this peculiar language i remember the gentleman perfectly thank you very much there's something to pay you for your trouble monsieur le baron is too generous is there any other service no no nothing thank you i have all that i require interposed the baron with a gesture of dismissal and evidently he had for five minutes later he walked into the office of the hotel and said to the clerk make out my bill please i shall be leaving england at once and immediately thereafter walked into a telephone booth consulted his notebook and rang up two fifty three four eighty soho and on getting it began to talk rapidly and softly to someone who understood french meantime mr narkom unaware of the little powder train he had unconsciously lighted had gone on up the stairs with his two companions purposely avoiding the lift that he might explain matters as they went piloted them safely to the suite occupied by captain maltravers 
and at the precise moment when baron rodolphe de montravan walked into the telephone booth cleek was meeting miss larue for the first time since those distressing days of eleven months ago and meeting mr harrison trent for the first time ever End of section 37thirty eight of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five. Cleek found young Trent an extremely handsome man of about three and thirty, of a highly strung, nervous temperament, and with an irritating habit of running his fingers through his hair when excited. Also, it seemed impossible for him to sit still for half a minute at a stretch. He must be constantly hopping up only to sit down again, and moving restlessly about as if he were doing his best to retain his composure, and found it difficult with Cleek's calm eyes fixed constantly upon him. "'I want to tell you something about that blood-stained sponge business, Mr. Cleek,' he said in his abrupt, jerky, uneasy manner. "'I never heard a word about it until last night, when Miss Larue confessed her former suspicions of my dear old dad.' and gave me all the details of the matter. That sponge had nothing to do with the affair at all. It was I that tucked it under the staircase where it was found, and I did so on the day before James Colliver's disappearance. The blood that had been on it was mine, not his. "'I see,' said Cleek serenely. "'The explanation, of course, is the good old tried-and-true refuge of the story-writers, namely a case of nose-bleeding, is it not?' yes admitted trent but with this difference mine wasn't an accidental affair at all it was the result of getting a jolly good hiding and i made an excuse to get away and hop out of town so that the dad wouldn't know about it nor see how i'd been battered the fact is i met one of our carmen in the upper hall he was as drunk as a lord and when i took him to task about it and threatened him with discharge he said something to me that i thought needed a jolly sight more than words by way of chastisement so i nipped off my coat and sailed into him it turned out that he was the better man and gave me all that i'd asked for in less than a minute's time so i shook hands with him told him to bundle off home and sleep himself sober and that if he wouldn't say anything about the matter i wouldn't either and he could turn up for work in the morning as usual then i washed up shoved the sponge under the staircase and nipped off out of town because you know it would make a deuced bad impression if any of the other workmen should find out that a member of the firm had been thrashed by one of the employees and draycott had done me up so beautifully that i was a sight for the gods the thing had been so frankly confessed that in spite of the fact of having in the beginning been rather repelled by him cleek could not but experience a feeling of liking for the man so that's how it happened is it he said with a laugh it is a brave man mr trent that will resist the opportunity to make himself a hero in the presence of the lady he loves and i hope i may be permitted to congratulate miss larue on the wisdom of her choice but now if you please let us get down at once to the details of the melancholy business we have in hand mr narkom has been telling me the amazing story of the boy's visit to the building and of his strange disappearance therein, but I should like to have a few further facts, if you will be so kind. What took the boy to the building in the first place? I am told he went there upon your invitation, but I confess that that seems rather odd to me. Why should a man of business want a boy to visit him during business hours? Good Lord, man, I couldn't have let him see what he wanted to see if he didn't come during business hours, could I? oh but that's rather ambiguous so i'll make haste to put it plainer young stan his christian name is stanley as i suppose you know young stan is mad to learn the business of theatrical property making and particularly that of the manufacture of those wax effigies etc which we supply for the use of drapers in their show windows and as he is now sixteen and of an age to begin thinking of some trade or profession for the future i thought it would save miss larue putting up a jolly big premium to have him taught outside 
if we took him into our business free so i invited him to come and look round and see if he thought he'd like it when he came to look into the messy details well he came rather late yesterday afternoon and i'd taken him round for just about ten or a dozen minutes when word was suddenly brought to me that the representative of one of the biggest managers in the country had just called with reference to an important order so of course i put back to the office as quickly as i could foot it young stan quite naturally following me as he didn't know his way about the place alone and being a modest retiring sort of boy didn't like facing the possibility of blundering into what might prove to be private quarters and things of that sort he said as much to me at the time well when i got back to the office i soon found that the business with my visitor was a matter that would take some time to settle you can't give a man an estimate all on a jump and without doing a bit of figuring you know so i told young stan that he might cut off and go over the place on his own if he liked as it had been arranged that when knocking off time came i was to go back with him to miss larue's flat where we all were to have supper together when i told him that he asked eagerly if he might go up to the wax figure department as he was particularly anxious to see loti at work and so loti cleek flung in the word so sharply that trent gave a nervous start just a moment please before you go any further mr trent sorry to interrupt but tell me please is the man who models your show window effigies named loti then is eh hmm any connection by chance with that once famous italian worker in wax giuseppe loti chap that used to make those splendid wax tableaux for the aden musee in paris some eighteen or twenty years ago same chap went all to pieces all of a sudden clear off his head for a time i've heard in the very height of his career because his wife left him a handsome frenchwoman years younger than he ran off with another chap and took every blessed thing of value she could lay her hands upon when but maybe you've heard the story i have said cleek it is one that is all too common on the continent also it happened that i was in paris at the time of the occurrence and so you have that great giuseppe loti at the head of your waxwork department eh what a come down in the world for him poor devil i thought he was dead ages ago he dropped out suddenly and disappeared from france entirely after that affair with his unfaithful wife the rumour was that he had committed suicide although that seemed as improbable as it now turns out to be in the face of the fact that on the night after his wife left him he turned up at the cafe royal and publicly no matter go on with the case please what about the boy let's see now where was i said trent knotting up his brow oh ah i recollect just where he asked me if he could go up and see loti at work of course i said that he could there wasn't any reason why i shouldn't as the place is open to inspection always so i opened the door and showed him the way to the staircase leading up to the glass room and then went to the speaking tube and called up loti to expect him and to treat him nicely as he was the nephew of the great miss larue and would in time be mine also was there any necessity for taking that precaution mr trent yes loti has developed a dashed bad temper since last autumn and is very eccentric very irritable not a bit like the solemn sedate old johnny he used to be even his work has deteriorated i think but one don't criticize it or he flies into a temper and threatens to leave and you don't wish him to of course his name must stand for something it stands for a great deal it's one of our biggest cards we can command twice as much for a loti figure as for one made by any other waxworker so we humour him in his little eccentricities and defer to him a great deal also as he prefers to live on the premises he saves us money in other ways serves for a watchman as well you understand oh he lives on the premises does he where in the glass room oh no that would not be possible the character as well as the position of that renders it impossible as a place of habitation he uses it after hours as a sort of sitting-room to be sure and has partly fitted it up as one but he sleeps eats and dresses in a room on the floor below not an adjoining one 
Oh, no, an adjoining room would be an impossibility. Our building is an end one, standing on the corner of a short passage which leads to nothing but a narrow alley running along parallel with the back of our premises, and the glass room covers nearly the entire roof of it. As a matter of fact, Mr. Cleek, although we call it that at the works, the term glass room is a misnomer. In reality, it's nothing more nor less than a good-sized lean-to greenhouse that the dad bought and had taken up there in sections, and its rear elevation rests against the side wall of a still higher building than ours next door, the premises of Storminger, the carriage builder, to be exact. But look here. Perhaps I can make the situation clearer by a rough sketch. Got a lead pencil and a bit of paper, anybody? Oh, thanks very much, dear. One can always rely upon you. Now, look here, Mr. Cleek. This is the way of it. You mustn't mind if it's a crude thing, because, you know, I'm a rotten bad draughtsman and can't draw for nuts. But all the same, this will do at a pinch. Here he leaned over the table in the centre of the room, and, taking the pencil and the blank back of the letter which Miss Larue had supplied, made a crude outline sketch. There you are he said suddenly, laying the crude drawing on the table before Cleek, and with him bending over it. "'You are supposed to be looking at the houses from the main thoroughfare, don't you know, and therefore at the front of them. This tall building on the left, Mark One, is Storminger's. The low one, Number Two, adjoining, is ours. And that cage-like looking thing, Three, on the top of it, is the glass room. Now, Along the front of it here, where I have put the long line with an X on the end, there runs a wooden partition with a door leading into the room itself, so that it's impossible for anybody on the opposite side of the main thoroughfare to see into the place at all. But that is not the case with regard to people living on the opposite side of the short passage. This is here that I have marked for, because there's nothing to obstruct the view but some rubbishy old lace curtains which Loti, in his endeavour to make the place what he calls homelike, would insist upon hanging, and they are so blessed thin that anybody can look right through them and see all over the place. Of course, though, there are blinds which he can pull down on the inside if the sun gets too strong, and when they are down nobody can see into the glass room at all. Pardon? Oh, we had it constructed of glass, Mr. Narkom, because of the necessity for having all the light obtainable in doing the minute work on some of the fine tableaus we produce for exhibition purposes. We're doing one now, the relief of luck now, for the big exhibition that's to be given next month at Olympia, and— The place marked six at the back of our building. Oh, that's the narrow alley of which I spoke. We've a back door opening into it, but it's practically useless, because the alley is so narrow one can't drive a vehicle through it. It's simply a right of way that can't legally be closed, and runs from Croom Street on the right, just along as far as Sturgis Lane on the left— not fifty people pass through it in a day's time. But to come back to the short passage, Mr. Cleek, observe there are no windows at all on the side of our building here, number two. There were once upon a time, but we had them bricked up, as we use that side for a paint frame with a movable bridge, so that it can be used for the purpose of painting scenery and drop curtains. But there are windows in the side of the house marked five, and directly opposite the point where I've put the arrow, there is one which belongs to a room occupied by Mrs. Sherman and her daughter, people who do bushel work for wholesale costume houses. Now, it, it happens that at the exact time when the porter says he showed young Stan into the glass room, those two women were sitting at work by that window, and the blinds not being drawn could see smack into the place, and are willing to take their oath that there was no living soul in it. How do they fix it as being, as you say, the exact time, Mr. Trent? If they couldn't see the porter come up to the glass room with the boy, how can they be sure of that? Oh, that's easily explained. There's a church not a great way distant. It has a clock in the steeple which strikes the hours, halves, and quarters— Mrs. Sherman says that when it chimed half-past four she was not only looking into the glass room, but was calling her daughter's attention to the fact that, whereas some few minutes previously she had seen Loti go out of the place, leaving a great pile of reference plates and scraps of material all over the floor, and he had never, to her positive knowledge, come back into it, there was the room looking as tidy as possible, 
and in the middle of it a table with a vase of pink roses upon it, which she certainly had not seen there when he left. "'Hello, hello,' interjected Cleek rather sharply. "'Let's have that again, please.' And he sat listening intently while Trent repeated the statement. Then of a sudden he gave his head an upward twitch, slapped his thigh, and leaning back in his seat, added with a brief little laugh, "'Well, of all the blithering idiots, and a simple little thing like that!' "'Like what, Mr. Cleek?' queried Trent in amazement. "'You don't surely mean to say that you can make anything important out of a table and a vase of flowers, because I may tell you that Loti is mad on flowers, and always has a vase of them in the room somewhere.' "'Does he, indeed?' natural inclination of the artistic temperament i dare say but never mind get on with the story mrs sherman fixes the hour when she noticed this as half past four you say how then does the porter who showed the boy into the glass room fix it may i ask by the same means precisely the striking of the church clock he remembers hearing it just as he reached the partitioned door and was indeed at particular pains to take out his watch to see if it tallied with it. Also, three of our scene-painters were passing along the hall at the foot of the short flight of steps leading up to the glass room at the time. They were going out to tea, and one of them sang out to him laughingly, "'Hello, Ginger, how does that two-shilling turnip of yours make it? Time for tea at Buckingham Palace?' For he had won the watch at a singing contest only the night before, and his mates had been chaffing him about it all day. In that manner, the exact time of his going to the door with the boy is fixed, and with three persons to corroborate it. A second later, the porter saw the boy push open the swing door and walk into the place, and as he turned and went back downstairs, he distinctly heard him say, "'Good afternoon, sir. Mr. Trent said I might come up and watch, if you don't mind.' "'Did he hear anybody reply?' No, he did not. He heard no one speak but the boy. I see. So then there is no actual proof that Loti was in there at the time, which of course makes the testimony of Mrs. Sherman and her daughter appear reliable when they say that the room was empty. Still, the boy was there if Loti wasn't, Mr. Cleek. There's proof enough that he did go into the place— even though those two women declare that the room was empty. Quite so, quite so. And when two and two don't make four, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. What does Loti himself say with regard to the circumstance? Or hasn't he been spoken to about it? My hat, yes. I went to him about it the very first thing. He says the boy never put in an appearance to his knowledge— that he never saw him. In fact, that just before half-past four he was taken with a violent attack of sick headache, the result of the fumes rising from the wax he was melting to model figures for the tableau, together with the smell of the chemicals used in preparing the background, and that he went down to his room to lie down for a time and dropped off to sleep. As a matter of fact, he was there in his room sleeping when at half-past six I went for the boy, and finding the glass room vacated, naturally set out to hunt up Loti and question him about the matter. When you called up to the glass room through the speaking tube to say that the boy was about to go up, who answered you, Loti? Yes. At what time was that, or can't you say positively? Not to the fraction of a moment, but I should say that it was about four or five minutes before the boy got there, say about five and twenty minutes past four. It wouldn't take him longer to get up to the top of the house, I fancy, and he certainly did not stop at any of the other departments on the way. Queer, isn't it, that the man should not have stopped to so much as welcome the boy, after you had been at such pains to tell him to be nice to him? Does he offer any explanation on that score? Yes, he says that as his head was so bad, he knew that he would probably be cross and crotchety. So, as I had asked him to be kind, he thought the best thing he could do was to leave a note on the table for the boy, 
telling him to make himself at home and to examine anything he pleased, but to be sure not to touch the cauldron in which the wax was simmering, as it tilted readily and he might get scalded. He was sorry to have to go, but his head ached so badly that he really had to lie down for a while. That note, I may tell you, was lying on the table when I went up to the glass room and failed to find the boy. It was that which told me where to go in order to find Loti and question him. I'll do him the credit of stating that when he heard of the boy's mysterious disappearance, he flung his headache and his creature comforts to the winds, and joined in the eager hunt for him as excitedly and as strenuously as anybody. He went through the building from top to bottom. He lifted every trap-door, crept into every nook and corner and hole and box into which it might be possible for the poor little chap to have fallen. But it was all useless, Mr. Cleek, every bit of it. The boy had vanished utterly and completely, from the minute the porter saw him pass the swing door and go into the glass room, we never discovered even the slightest trace of him, nor have we been able to do so since. He is gone. He has vanished as completely as if he had melted into thin air, and if there is any ghost of a clue to his whereabouts existing, let us go and see if we can unearth it, interrupted Cleek, rising. Mr. Narkom, is the limousine within easy reach? Yes, waiting in Tavistock Street, dear chap. I told Leonard to be on the lookout for us. Good. Then if Miss Larue will allow Mr. Trent to escort her as far as the pavement, and he will then go on alone to his place of business and await us there, you and I will leave the hotel by the back way and join him as soon as possible. Leave by the front entrance, if you be so kind, and pardon one last word, Mr. Trent, before you go. At the time when this boy's father vanished in much the same way eleven months ago, you had, I believe, a door porter at your establishment named Felix Murchison. Is that man still in your employ? No, Mr. Cleek. He left about a week or so after James Colliver's disappearance. "'Know where he is?' "'Not the slightest idea. "'As a matter of fact, he suddenly inherited some money "'and said he was going to emigrate to America. "'But I don't know if he did or not. "'Why?' "'Oh, nothing in particular. "'Only that I shouldn't be surprised "'if the person who supplied that money "'was the pawnbroker who received in pledge "'the jewels which your father handed over to James Colliver.' and that the sum which Felix Murchison inherited so suddenly was the one hundred and fifty pounds advanced upon those gems. How utterly absurd! My dear Mr. Cleek, you must surely remember that the pawnbroker said the chap who pawned the jewels was a gentlemanly-appearing person, of good manners and speech, and Murchison is the last man in the world to answer to that description. "'Great, hulking, bull-necked, illiterate animal of that sort, "'without an H in his vocabulary, and with no more manners than a pig. "'Precisely why I feel so certain now "'that the pawnbroker's advance was paid over to him,' "'said Cleek, with a twitch of the shoulder. "'Live and learn, my friend, live and learn. Eleven months ago I couldn't for the life of me understand why those jewels had been pawned at all. Today I realise that it was the only possible course. Miss Leroux, my compliments. Au revoir. And he bowed her out of the room with the grace of a courtier, standing well out of sight from the hallway until the door had closed behind her and her companion, and he was again alone with the superintendent. "'Now for it,' as they used to say in the old melodramas. He laughed, stepping sharply to a wardrobe, and producing first a broad-brimmed cavalry hat, which he immediately put on, and then a pair of bright steel handcuffs. "'We may have use for this very effective type of wristlets, Mr. Narkom, so it's well to go prepared for emergencies. Now then, off with you while I lock the door.' That's the way to the staircase. Nip down it to the American bar. There's a passage from that leading out to the embankment gardens. A taxi from there will whisk us along Savoy Street, across the Strand, and up Wellington Street to Tavistock in less than no time. 
so we may look to be with Leonard inside of another ten minutes. Righto, gave back the superintendent. And I can get rid of this dashed rig as soon as we're in the limousine. But I say, any ideas, old chap, eh? Yes, two or three. One of them is that this is going to be one of the simplest cases I ever tackled. Lay you a sovereign to a sixpence, Mr. Narkom, that I solve the riddle of that glass room before they ring up the curtain of any theatre in London tonight. What's that? Lying? No, certainly not. There's been no lying in the matter at all. It isn't a case of that sort. The pawnbroker did not lie, the porter who says he showed the boy into the room did not lie, and the two women who looked into it and saw nothing but an empty room did not lie either. The only thing that did lie was a vase of pink roses, a bunch of natural ananiasis that tried to make people believe that they had been blooming and keeping fresh ever since last August. Good Lord! You don't surely think that that loaded chap— Gently, gently, my friend. Don't let yourself get excited. Besides, I may be all at sea for all my cocksureness. I don't think I am, but one never knows. I'll tell you one thing, however. The man with whom Madame Loti eloped had, for the purpose of carrying on the intrigue, enlisted as a student under her husband— and gulled the poor fool by pretending that he wished to learn waxwork making when his one desire was to make love to the man's worthless wife when they eloped and loti knew for the first time what a dupe he had been he publicly swore in the open room of the cafe royal that he would never rest until he had run that man down and had exterminated him and every living creature in whose veins his blood flowed the man was an English actor, Mr. Narkom. He posed under the nom de théâtre of Jason Monteith. His real name was James Colliver. Step livelier, please. We're dawdling. End of section 38《of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 They that climb the highest have the farthest to fall. It was after five o'clock when the limousine arrived at the premises of Trent and Son, and Cleek, guided by the junior member of the firm and accompanied by Superintendent Narkom, climbed the steep stairs to the house top and was shown into the glass room. His first impression, as the door swung inward, was of a scent of flowers so heavy as to be oppressive. His second, of entering into a light so brilliant that it seemed a very glare of gold, for the low-dropped sun, which yellowed all the sky, flooded the place with a radiance which made him blink, and it was some little time before his eyes could accustom themselves to it sufficient to let him discover that the old Italian wax-worker was there, busy on his latest tableau. Cleek blinked and looked at the old man, serenely at first, then blinked and looked again, conscious of an overwhelming sense of amazement and defeat for just one fraction of a minute, and that some of his cocksure theories regarding the case had suddenly been knocked into a cocked hat. No wonder Mr. Harrison Trent had spoken of deterioration in the art of this once celebrated modeller. No wonder. The man was not Giuseppe Lotti at all, not that world-famed worker in wax who had sworn in those bitter other days to have the life of the vanished James Colliver. Chapter 37 Cleek's equanimity did not desert him, however. It was one of his strong points that he always kept his mental balance, even when his most promising theories were deracinated. He therefore showed not the slightest trace of the disappointment with which this utterly unexpected discovery had filled him 
but with the most placid exterior imaginable suffered himself to be introduced to the old waxworker who was at the time working assiduously upon the huge tableau piece designed for the forthcoming indian exhibition a well-executed assembly of figures which occupied a considerable portion of the rear end of the glass room and represented that moment when the relief force burst through the stockade at lucknow and came to the rescue of the beleaguered garrison a couple of gentlemen from scotland yard loti who have come to look into the matter of young colliver's disappearance was the way in which trent made that introduction you can go on with your work they won't interfere with you welcome gentlemen most welcome said loti with that courtesy which continental people never quite forget then nodded and went on with his work as he had been told adding with a mournful shake of the head ah a strange business that signori an exceedingly strange business very agreed cleek off-handedly and from the other end of the room ripping quarters these signor and now that i've seen em i don't mind confessing that my pet theory has gone all to smash and i'm up a gum tree so to speak i'd an idea you know that there might be a sliding panel or a trap door which you chaps here might have overlooked and down which the boy might have dropped or maybe gone on a little explorin expedition of his own don't you know and hadn't been able to get back well of all the idiotic ideas began trent but was suffered to get no further yes isn't it agreed cleek with his best blithering idiot air i realize that now that i see your floors of concrete necessary i suppose on account of the chemicals and the inflammable nature of the wax you could have a ripping old flare up here if that stuff was to catch fire from a dropped match or anything of that sort eh what blessed if i can see turning slowly on his heel and looking all round the room a ghost of a place where the young nipper could have got it's a facer for me but i say as if suddenly struck with an idea you don't think that he nipped something valuable and cut off with it do you didn't miss any money or anything of that sort which you'd left lying about did you mr uh, lotus eh loti if you please signor i had indeed hoped that my name was well known enough to poof no i miss nothing i miss not so much as a pin i'm told he shall not have been that kind of a boy and then with a shake of the head and a pitying glance toward the author of these two asinine theories regarding the strange disappearance returned to his work of putting the finishing touches to a recumbent figure representing a dead soldier lying in the foreground of the tableau oh well you never can tell what boys will do and it's an old saying that a good booty makes many a thief replied cleek airily reckon i'll have to hunt up something a bit more promising then don't mind my poking about a bit do you not in the slightest signor replied the italian and glanced sympathizingly up at trent and gave his shoulders a significant shrug as if to say is this the best that scotland yard can turn out when cleek began turning over costume plates and looking under books and scraps of material which lay scattered about the floor and even took to examining the jugs and vases and tumblers in which the signor's bunches of cut flowers were placed there were many of them on tables and chairs and shelves and even on the platform of the tableau itself so many in fact that he was minded by their profusion of what trent had said regarding the old waxworker's great love of flowers he looked round the room in an apparently perfunctory manner but in reality with a photographic eye for its every detail finding that it agreed in every particular with the description which trent had given him there were the cheap lace curtains all along the glazed side which overlooked the short passage leading down to the narrow alley 
but they were of so thin a quality and so scantily patterned that the mesh did not obstruct the view in any manner merely rendering it a trifle hazy for he could himself see from where he stood the window in the side of the house opposite and seated at that window mrs sherman and her daughter busy at their endless sewing and there too were the blinds strong blue linen ones running on rings and cords with which as he had been told it was possible to arrange the light as occasion required they were fashioned somewhat after the manner of those seen in the studios of photographers several sectional ones overhead and one long one for that side of the room which overlooked the short passage and as showing how minute was cleek's inspection for all its seeming indifference it may be remarked that he observed a peculiarity regarding that long blind which not one person in a hundred would have noticed that is to say that whereas when one looks at a window from the interior of a room one invariably finds that the blinds are against the glass and that the curtains are so hung as to be behind them when viewed from the street here was a case of the exactly opposite arrangement being put into force to wit it was the lace curtains which hung against the window panes and the big blind which was next to the room so that if pulled down a person standing within would see no lace curtains at all while at the same time they would remain distinctly visible to anybody standing without if this small discrepancy called for any comment cleek made none audibly merely glanced at the blind and glanced away again and went on examining the books and the vases of flowers and continued his apparently aimless wandering about the room of a sudden however he did a singular thing one which was fraught with much significance to mr narkom who knew the signs so well his wandering had brought him within touching distance of the busy waxworker who just at that moment half turned and stretched forth his hand to pick up a tool which had fallen to the floor the act of recovering which sent his wrist protruding a bit beyond the cuff of his working blouse what narkom saw was the quick twitch of cleek's eye in the direction of that hand then its swift travelling to the man's face and travelling off again to other things and he knew what was coming when his great ally began to pat his pockets and rummage about his person as if endeavouring to find something my luck said cleek with an impatient jerk of the head not a blessed cigarette with me mr narkom and you know what a duffer i am if i can't smoke when i'm trying to think i say nip out will you and get me a packet there scribbling something on a leaf from his notebook and pushing it into the superintendent's hand that's the brand i like it's no use bringing me any other look em up for me will you there's a good friend narkom made no reply but merely left the room with the paper crumpled in his shut hand and went downstairs as fast as he could travel what he did in the interval is a matter for further consideration at present it need only be said that had any one looked across the short passage some eight or ten minutes after his departure narkom might have been seen standing in the background of the room at whose window mrs sherman and her daughter still sat sewing meanwhile cleek appeared to have forgotten all about the matter which was the prime reason for his presence in the place and to have become absorbingly interested in the business of tableau making for he plied the old italian with endless questions relative to the one he was engaged in constructing jip you don't mean to tell me that you make the whole blessed thing yourself do you model the figures group em paint the blessed background and all said he with yokel like amazement you do my hat but you're a wonder that background's one of the best i've ever clapped eyes on and the figures i could swear that that fellow bursting in with a sword in his hand was alive if i didn't know better and as for this dead johnny here in the foreground that you're working on he's a marvel what do you stuff the blessed things with 
or don't you stuff em at all oh yes senor they are stuffed all of them there is a wicker framework covered with canvas and inside cotton waste old paper straw you don't mean it well i'm blessed nothing but waste stuff and straw why that fellow over there the sepoy chap with a gun in his hat oh good lord just my blessed luck i hope to heaven i haven't spoiled anything for in leaning over to indicate the figure alluded to he had blundered against the edge of the low platform lost his balance and sprawled over so awkwardly and abruptly that but for the fact that the figure of the dead soldier was there for his hand to fall upon in time to check it he must have pitched headlong into the very heart of the tableau and done no end of damage fortunately however not a figure had been thrown down and even the dead soldier had stood the shock uncommonly well not even a dent showing though cleek had come down rather heavily and his palm had struck smack on the figure's chest tut 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 exclaimed the italian with angry impatience oh do have a little care signor the bull in a china shop is alone like this and he turned his back upon this stupid blunderer even though cleek was profuse in his apologies and looked as sorry as he declared after a time however he went off on another tack for his quick travelling glance had shown him mr narkom in the house across the passage and he turned on his heel and walked away rapidly tell you what it is it's this blessed glare of light that's accountable he said a body's likely to stumble over anything with the light streaming into the place in this fashion what you want in here is a bit of shade like this here he crossed the room hastily and reaching up pulled down the long window blind with a sudden jerk but before either trent or the italian could offer any objection to this interference with the conditions under which the waxworker chose to conduct his labours he seemed himself to realise that the proceeding did not mend matters and releasing his hold upon the blind let the spring of the roller carry it up again to its original position as he did this he said with a peculiarly asinine air that's a bit worse than the other by jip makes the blessed place too dashed dark altogether so it's not the light that's to blame after all i should have thought even a fool might have known that gave back the waxworker almost savagely the light is poor enough as it is look for yourself it is only the afterglow and even that is already declining Pooh! and here as if in disgust too great for words he blew the breath from his lips with a sharp short gust and facing about again went back to his work on the tableau cleek made no response nor yet did trent by this time even he had begun to think that accident more than brains must have been at the bottom of the man's many successes that he was in reality nothing more than a blundering muddler and after another ten minutes of putting up with his crazy methods had just made up his mind to appeal to narkom for the aid of another detective when the end which was all along being prepared came with such a rush that it fairly made his head swim all that he was ever able clearly to recall of it was that there came a sudden sound of clattering footsteps rushing pell-mell up the staircase that the partition door was flung open abruptly to admit mr maverick narkom with three or four of the firm's employees pressing close upon his heels that the superintendent had but just cried out excitedly yes man yes when there arose a wild clatter of falling figures a snarl a scuffle a cry and that when he faced round in the direction of it there was the lucknow tableau piled up in a heap of fallen scenery and smashed waxworks and in the middle of the ruin there was the signor lying on his back with a band of steel upon each wrist and over him cleek with a knee on the man's chest and the look of a fury in his eyes crying aloud come out of it come out of it you brute beast your little dodge has failed and hard on the heels of that shock mr trent received another 
for of a sudden he saw cleek pluck a wig from the man's head and leave a white line showing above the place where the joining paste once had met the grease paint with which the fellow's face was coloured and heard him say as he tossed that wig toward him and rose out of your own stage properties mr trent borrowed to be returned like this heaven above man said trent in utter bewilderment what's the meaning of it all who is that man then since it's clear he's not loti a very excellent actor in his day mr trent his name is james colliver replied cleek i came to this place fully convinced that loti had murdered him i now know that he murdered loti and that to that crime he has added a yet more abominable one by killing his own son it's a lie it's a lie i didn't i didn't i never saw the boy screeched out colliver in a very panic of terror i've never killed anyone loti sold out to me loti went back to france i pawned the jewels to get the money to pay him to go oh no you didn't my friend said cleek you performed that operation to shut felix murchison's mouth the one man who could swear and did swear that james colliver never left this building on the day of his disappearance and who probably would have said more if you hadn't made it worth his while to shut his mouth and to disappear you and i know my friend that loti was the last man on this earth with whom you could come to terms upon anything he had publicly declared that he would have your life and he'd have kept his word if you hadn't turned the tables and killed him you stole his wife and you were never even man enough to marry her even though she had borne you a son and clung to you to the end poor wretch you killed loti and you killed your own son no doubt he is better off poor little chap to be dead and gone rather than to live with the shadow of illegitimacy upon him and no doubt either that when he came up here yesterday to meet giuseppe loti he saw what i saw to-day and knew you as i knew you then the scar on the wrist which was one of the marks of identification given me at the time i was sent to hunt you up and you killed him to shut his mouth i didn't i didn't he protested wildly i never saw him he wasn't here the women in the house across the way will swear that they saw the empty room not now declared cleek with emphasis i've convinced them to the contrary mr trent let a couple of your men come over here and take charge of this fellow please and i will convince you as well that's right my lads lay hold of the beggar and don't let him get a chance to make a dash for the stairs got him fast have you good now then mr james colliver this is what those deluded women saw this little dodge which is going to help jack ketch to come into his own speaking he walked rapidly across to the long blind pulled it down to its full length then with a wrench tore it wholly from the roller and whirled it over so that they who were within could now see the outer side it bore painted upon it a perfect representation of the interior of the glass room even to the little spindle-legged table with a vase of pink roses upon it which now stood at that room's far end a clever idea colliver and a good piece of painting he said it took me in once last august just as it took in mrs sherman and her daughter yesterday the mistiness of the lace curtains falling over it lent just the effect of distance that was required to perfect the illusion and to prevent anybody from detecting the paint as for the boy gently lads gently don't let the beggar in his struggles make you step on that dead soldier under the thick coating of wax a human body lies the boy's hello gone off his balance eh at the knowledge that the game is entirely up this as colliver with a terrible cry collapsed suddenly and fell to the floor shrieking and grovelling 
They are a cowardly lot, these brute beast men, when it comes to the wall and the final corner. Mr. Trent, break this to Miss Larue as gently as you can. She has suffered a great deal, poor girl, and it is bound to be a shock. She doesn't know that the woman he called his wife never really was his wife. She doesn't know about Loti or his threat. If she had, she'd have told me, and I might have got on the trail in the first case, instead of waiting to pick it up like this. He paused and held up his hand. Through all this, Colliver had not once ceased grovelling and screaming, but it was not his cries that had drawn that gesture from Cleek. It was the sound of someone racing at top speed up the outer stairs, and with it the jar of many excited voices mingled in a babble of utter confusion. The door of the glass room swung inward abruptly, and the head bookkeeper looked in with a crowd of clerks behind him. "'Mr. Trent, sir, whatever is the matter? Is anybody hurt? I never heard such screams. The whole place is ringing with them, and there's a crowd gathering about the door.' Cleek left the junior partner to explain the situation, stepped to the side of the glass room, looked down, saw that the statement was quite true, and stepped sharply back again. "'We shall have to defer removing our prisoner until it gets dark, I fancy, Mr. Narkom,' he said serenely. "'And with Mr. Trent's permission we will make use of the door leading into the alley at the back when that time comes. "'Bookkeeper?' "'Yes, sir.' You might explain to the constable on duty in the neighbourhood, if he comes to inquire, that is, the cause of the disturbance, and that Scotland Yard is in charge and Superintendent Narkom already on the premises. That's all, thank you. You may close the door and take your colleagues below. Hello. Our prisoner seems to be subsiding into something akin to gibbering idiocy, Mr. Trent. Fright has turned his brain, apparently. Let us make use of the respite from his shrieks. You will, of course, wish to hear how I got on the track of the man, and what were the clues which led up to the solving of the affair. Well, you shall. Sit down, and while we are waiting for the darkness to come, I'll give you the complete explanation. End of section 39 40 of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 38. Colliver, who had now sunk into a state of babbling incoherence, lay on his face in the wreck of the tableau, rolling his head from side to side and clasping and unclasping his manacled hands. Trent turned his back upon the unpleasant sight and placing three chairs at the opposite end of the room, dropped into one and lifted an eager countenance to Cleek. "'Tell me, first of all,' he asked, "'how under heaven you came to suspect how the disappearance of the boy was managed. It seems like magic to me. When in the world did you get the first clue to it, Mr. Cleek?' "'Never until I heard of those two women looking into this room and seeing the vase of pink roses standing on a spindle-legged table in the centre of it,' he replied. "'You see, even in the old days when I had the other case in hand and was searching for a clue to Colliver's disappearance, never had any one mentioned the name of Loti to me. I knew, of course, that you made wax figures here, but I never heard until this afternoon that Loti was the man who was employed to model them. I also knew about the existence of the glass room and its position, for I had been at the pains of inspecting it from the outside. That came about in this way. Just before Miss Larue closed up the case of James Colliver, I had obtained the first actual clue to his movements after he left Mr. Trent Sr. and came out of the office. That clue came from the door porter Felix Murchison. What careful pumping got out of him was that when James Colliver left the office, he had asked him, Murchison, which was the way to the place where they made the waxworks, as he'd heard they were making a head of Miss Larue to be used in the execution scene of Catherine Howard, and he'd like to have a look at it. 
Murchison said that he told him the figures were made in a glass room on the top of the house, and directed him how to reach it. He went up the stairs, and that was the last that was seen of him. Naturally, when I heard that, I thought I'd like to see the exterior of the building, to ascertain if there was any opening, door or window, by which he could have left the upper floor without coming down the main staircase. That led me to beg permission of the people in the house across the passage there to look from one of the side windows, and so gave me my first view of the glass room. What I saw was exactly what Mrs. Sherman and her daughter saw yesterday, namely that spick-and-span room with the table in the centre and the vase of pink roses standing on it. Need I go further than to say that when I heard of those women seeing a room that was badly littered a few minutes before suddenly become a tidy one with a table and a vase of roses standing in the middle of it, without anybody having come into the place for the purpose of making the change, I instantly remembered my own experience and suspected a painted blind. When I entered this room today and saw the peculiar position of that blind, I became almost certain I had hit upon the truth, and sent Mr. Narkom to the house across the way to test it. That's why I pulled the blind down. Why I stumbled and nearly fell into the tableau was because I had a faint suspicion of the horrible truth when I noticed how abominably thick the neck, hands, and ankles of that dead soldier were, and I wanted to test the truth or falseness of the straw stuffing assertion by actual touch, particularly as I felt sure that the presence of all these strongly scented flowers was for the purpose of covering less agreeable odours, should the heat of the weather cause decomposition to set in before he could dispose of the body. I don't think he ever was mad enough to intend letting the thing remain a part of the tableau. I fancy he would have found an excuse to get it out somehow, and to make away with it entirely, as, no doubt, he did with the body of Loti. What's that, Mr. Narkom? No, I don't think that Murchison had any actual hand in the crime, or really knew the identity of the man. I fancy he must have gone up to tell the fictitious Loti that he knew James Colliver had entered that glass room and never come out of it, and Colliver, of course, had to shut his mouth by buying him off and sending him out of the country. That is why he took yet another disguise and pawned the jewels. He had to get the money some way. As for the rest, I imagine that when Colliver went up to the room to see that wax head, and Loti caught sight of him, the old Italian jumped on him like a mad tiger, and seeing that it was Loti's life or his own, Colliver throttled him. When that was done, the necessity for disposing of the body arose, and the imposture was the actual outcome of a desire to save his own neck. That's all, I think, Mr. Narkom. So you may revise your notes and mark down the Colliver case as solved at last, and the mystery of it cleared up after all. Three hours of patient waiting had passed and gone. The darkness had fallen. The streets were still, save for the faint hum of life coming from districts afar, and the time for action had come at last. Cleek rose and put on his hat. "'I think we may safely venture to remove our prisoner now, Mr. Narkom,' he said. "'And if you will slip out the back way and get Leonard to bring the limousine around to the head of that narrow alley—' "'They're there already, dear chap.' I stationed Leonard there when I went across to look into that business about the painted blind. It seemed the least conspicuous place for him to wait. Excellent. Then, if you will run on ahead and have the door of it open for me and everything ready, so that we may whisk him in and be off like a shot, and Mr. Trent will let one of these good chaps here run down to the man's room and fetch him a hat, I'll attend to his removal." "'Here's one here, sir, that'll do it a pinch and save time,' suggested one of the men, picking up a cavalryman's hat from the wreck of the ruined tableau and dusting it by slapping it against his thigh. 
"'I don't think he'll resist much, sir. "'He seems to have gone clear off his biscuit "'and not to know enough for that. "'But if you'd like me and my mate to lend a hand... "'No, thanks. "'I shall be able to manage him myself, I fancy,' "'said Cleek serenely. "'Get him on his feet, please. "'That's the business. "'Now then, Mr. Narkom, nip off. "'I'm following.' Mr. Narkom nipped off without an instant's delay, and two minutes later saw him slipping out through the rear door of the building, with Cleek and the jabbering, unresisting prisoner at the bottom of the last flight of stairs, not twenty yards behind. But the passage of the next half-minute saw something of more moment still, for as Narkom ran on tiptoe up the dim alley to the waiting limousine standing at its western end, and unlatching the vehicle's door, swung it open to be ready for Cleek. Out of the stillness there roared suddenly the shrill note of a dog-whistle, and all in a moment there was mischief. A crowd of quick-moving Apache figures sprang up from sheltering doors, and scudding past him, headed full tilt down the narrow alley, calling out as they ran that piercing, La, 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 which is the war-cry of their kind a blind rage all the more maddening in that it was impotent since he had neither weapon to defend nor the power to slay swept down upon the superintendent as he realized the import of that mad rush and ducking down his head he bolted after them into the thick of them punching banging slogging shouting swearing an incarnate passion the epitome of man's love for man a little fat fury that was all a whirl of flying fists as it swept onward and that seemed to go absolutely insane at what he looked up the alley and saw get back Cleek! get back for god's sake he yelled in a very panic of fear and dismay then cleft his way with beating arms and kicking feet through the hampering crowd arrowed out of its midst and bore down upon the cavalry-hatted figure that had stepped out of the dark doorway of trent and son's building and was standing flattened against the rear wall of it he reached out his hand and made a blind clutch at it and while he was yet far out of reaching distance of it faced round and made a wild effort to cover it with his short fat body and his arms outflung like a crucifix and looked at the apaches and swore without one thought of being profane me you damn devils me me not him not him damn you damn you damn you he cried hoarse-throated and said no more the scuttling crowd came up with him broke about him swept past him a loud explosion sounded a flare of light broke full against the cavalry hat a stifling odour of picric acid filled the air and gripped the throat and with its coming man and hat slid down the wall and dropped at its foot a crumpled heap that never in this world would stand erect again killed killed half cried half groaned the superintendent staggering a bit as the crowd flew on up the alley and vanished around the corner of the street into which it merged oh my god after all my care after all my love for him killed like a dog oh cleek oh cleek the dearest friend the finest pal the greatest detective genius of the age and then, swinging his arm up and across his eyes and holding it there, made a queer choking sound behind the sheltering crook of it. But of a sudden a voice spoke up from the darkness of the open door nearby, and said quietly, "'That's the finest compliment I ever had paid me in all my life, Mr. Narkom. Don't worry over me, dear friend.' I'm still able to sit up and take nourishment. The Apaches have saved the public executioner a morning's work. Colliver has parted with his brains forever, and may God have mercy on his soul. Cleek! Mr. Narkom scarcely knew his own voice, such a screaming thing it was. Cleek, dear chap, is it you? To be sure. Come inside here if you doubt it. "'Come quickly. There's a crowd of quite a different sort coming. "'The report of that bomb has aroused the neighbourhood, 
and i have quite enough of crowds for one evening thank you narkom was inside the building before you could have said jack robinson pump-handling cleek with all his might and generally deporting himself like a man gone daft i thought they'd finished you i thought they'd done you in it was the apache you know and that infernal scoundrel valdemar he must have found out somehow he said excitedly but we've got it on him at last cleek he's come within the law's reach after all to be sure but i doubt if the law will be able to find him mr narkom he will have left the country before the trap was actually sprung believe me or failing that will be well on his way out of it uh, perhaps not absolutely out of it dear chap there are the ports you know and so long as he is on english soil come and see come and see we may be able to head him off let's get out by way of the front of the building cleek and if i can once get to the telegraph and wire to the coast and he hasn't yet sailed come on come on oh no wait a moment that's a constable out there asking for information i'll nip out and let him know that the yard's on the case and give him a few orders about reporting it wait for me at the front door old chap with you in a winking he stepped out into the alley as he spoke and mingled with the gathering crowd but cleek did not stir the alley was no longer dark for with the gathering of the crowd lights had come and he stood for many minutes staring into it and breathing hard and the colour draining slowly out of his face until it was like a thing of wax outside in the narrow alley the gathering of curious ones which the sound of the explosion and the sight of a running policeman had drawn to the place was every moment thickening and with the latest addition to it there had come hurrying into the narrow space a morbid-minded newsboy with the customary bulletin sheet pinned over his chest the evening news six o'clock edition that bulletin was headed and under that heading there was set forth in big black type end of the mauravanian revolution fall of the capital flight of the deposed king overwhelming success of irma's troops mr narkom said cleek when at the end of ten minutes the superintendent came bustling back hot and eager to begin the effort to head off count valdemar mr narkom dear friend the days of trouble and distress are over and the good old times you have so often sighed for have come back look at that newsboy's bulletin valdemar is too late in all things and we have seen the last of him for ever end of section forty Section forty one of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epilogue The Affair of the Man Who Was Found. Part one. Mr. Maverick Narkom glanced up at the calendar hanging on the office wall, saw that it recorded the date as August the eighteenth, and then glanced back to the sheet of memoranda lying on his desk and forthwith began to scratch his bald spot perplexedly i wonder if i dare do it he queried of himself in the unspoken words of thought it seems such a pity when the beggar's wedding day is so blessed near and a man wants his last week of single blessedness all to himself by james if he can get it still it's a case after his own heart the reward's big and would be a nice little nest egg to begin married life upon besides he's had a fairly good rest as it is when i come to think of it nothing much to do since the time when that mauravanian business came to an end i fancy he rather looked to have something come out of that in the beginning from the frequent inquiries he made regarding what that johnny count irma and the new parliament were doing but it never did 
and now after all that rest and this a case of so much importance gad i believe i'll risk it he can't do any more than decline yes by james i will his indecision once conquered he took the plunge instantly caught up the desk telephone called for a number and two minutes later was talking to cleek thus i say old chap don't snap my head off for suggesting such a thing at such a time but i've a most extraordinary case on hand and i hope to heaven that you will help me out with it what's that oh come now that's ripping off you old chap and i'm as pleased as punch what oh get along with you no more than you do for me under the same circumstances i'll be sworn yes to-day as early as possible right you are then could you manage to meet me in the bar parlour of a little inn called the french horn out sheer way in surrey about four o'clock could eh good man oh uh, by the way come prepared to meet a lady of title old chap she's the client thanks very much good-bye then he hung up the receiver rang for leonard and set about preparing for the journey forthwith and this if you please was how it came to pass that when mr maverick narkom turned up at the french horn that afternoon he found a saddle-horse tethered to a post outside and cleek looking very much like one of the regular habitues of rotten row who had taken it into his mind to canter out into the country for a change standing in the bar parlour window and looking out with appreciative eyes upon the broad stretch of green downs that billowed away to meet the distant hills my dear chap how on earth do you manage it said the superintendent eyeing him with open approval not to say admiration i don't mean the mere putting on the clothes and looking the part i've seen dozens in my time who could do that right enough but the beggars always fell down when it came to the acting and the talking while you i don't know what the dickens it is nor how you manage to get it but there's a certain something or other in your bearing your manner your look when you tackle this sort of thing that i always believed a man had to be born to and couldn't possibly acquire in any other way there you are wrong my dear friend it is possible as you see that is what makes the difference between the mere actor and the real artiste replied cleek with an air of conceited self-appreciation which was either a clever illusion or an exhibition of great weakness if one man might not do these things better than another man we should have no irvings to illuminate the stage and acting would drop at once from its place among the arts to the undignified level of a tawdry trade and now as our american cousins say let's come down to brass tacks what's the case and who's the lady the widow of the late sir george essington and grandmother of the young gentleman in whose interest you are to be consulted grandmother eh then the lady is no longer young not as years go although to look at her you would hardly suspect that she is a day over five-and-thirty the gentleman with the hourglass has dealt very very lightly with her where he has failed to be considerate however the ladies who conduct certain parlours in bond street have come to the rescue in fine style oh she is that kind of woman is she said cleek with a pitch of the shoulders i have no patience with the breed as if there was anything more charming than a dear wrinkly old grandmother who bears her years gracefully and fusses over her children's children like an old hen with a brood of downy chicks but a grandmother who goes in for wrinkle eradicators cream of lilies skin tighteners milk of roses and things of that kind <laughs> it has been my experience mr narkom that when a woman has any real cause for worrying over the condition of her face 
she usually has a just one to be anxious over that of her soul. So this old lady is one of the face-painters, is she? My dear chap, let me correct an error. A grandmother her ladyship may be, but she is decidedly not an old one. I believe she was only a mere girl when she married her late husband. At any rate, she certainly can't be a day over forty-five at the present moment. A frivolous and a recklessly extravagant woman she undoubtedly is. Indeed, her extravagances helped as much as anything to bring her husband into the bankruptcy court before he died. But beyond that, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with her soul. Possibly not. There's always an exception to every rule, said Cleek. Her ladyship may be the shining exception to this unpleasant one of the face-painters. Let us hope so. English, is she? Oh, yes. That is, her father was English, and she herself was born in Buckinghamshire. Her mother, however, was an Italian, a lineal descendant of a once great and powerful Roman family named De Catani. Which, supplemented Cleek with one of his curious one-sided smiles, through an anti-papal union between Pope Alexander the Sixth and the beautiful Giovanna de Catane, otherwise Venozza, gave to the world those two arch-poisoners and devils of iniquity, Caesar and Lucretia Borgia. Lady Essington's family tree supplies a mixture which is certainly unique. A fine, fruity English pie with a rotten apple in it. Hmm. If her ladyship has inherited any of the beauty of her famous ancestress, for in 1490, when she flourished, Giovanna de Catane was said to be the most beautiful woman in the world. She should be something good to look upon. She is, replied Narkom. You'll find her when she comes. One of the handsomest and most charming women you ever met. Ah, then she has inherited some of the attractions and accomplishments of her famous forebears. I wonder if there has also come down to her as well the formula of those remarkable secret poisons for which Lucretia Borgia and her brother Caesar were so widely famed. They were marvellous things, those Borgia decoctions. Marvellous and abominable. Horrible, agreed Narkom, a curious shadow of unrest coming over him at this subject rising at this particular time. Modern chemistry has, I believe, been quite unable to duplicate them. There is, for instance, that appalling thing, the aquatafana, the very fumes of which caused instant death. Aquatafana was not a Borgian poison, my friend, said Cleek with a smile. It was discovered more than two hundred years after their time, in 1668 to be exact, by one Jean-Baptiste de Gaudin, Seigneur de Saint-Croix, the paramour and accomplice of that unnatural French fiend Marie-Marquise de Brinvilliers. Its discoverer himself died through dropping the glass mask from his face and inhaling the fumes while he was preparing the hellish mixture. The secret of its manufacture did not, however, die with him. Many chemists can today reproduce it. Indeed, I myself could give you the formula where it required. You, gad, man, what don't you know? In heaven's name, Cleek, what caused you to dip into all these unholy things? The same impulse which causes a drowning man to grip at a straw, Mr. Narkom, the desire for self-preservation. Remember what I was in those other days, and with whom I associated. Believe me, the statement that there is honour among thieves is a pleasant fiction and nothing more. For once a man sets out to be a professional thief, he and honour are no longer on speaking terms. I never could be wholly sure with that lot, and my biggest coups were always a source of danger to me after they had been successfully completed. 
it became necessary for me to study all poisons, all secret arts of destruction, that I might guard against them and might know the proper antidote. As for the rest, shh, mum's a fine wine. Here comes the landlady with the tea. We'll drop the case until afterward. Now tell me, said Cleek after the landlady had gone and they were again in sole possession of the room. What is it this Lady Essington wants of me? And what sort of a chap is this grandson in whose interest she is acting? Is he with her in this appeal to the yard? Certainly not, my dear fellow. Why, he's little more than a baby, not over three at the most. Ever hear anybody speak of the golden boy, old chap? What, the baby Earl of Strathmere? The little chap who inherited a title and a million through the drowning of his parents in the wreck of the yacht mystery. That's the little gentleman, the right honourable Cedric Eustace George Carruthers, 27th Earl Strathmere, variously known as the millionaire baby and the golden boy. His mother was Lady Essington's only daughter. She was only eighteen when she married Strathmere, only twenty-two when she and her husband were drowned a little over a year ago. Early enough to go out of the world that, poor girl, said Cleek sympathetically. And to leave that little shaver all alone, robbed at one blow of both father and mother. Hard lines, my friend, hard lines. It is fair to suppose, is it not, that with the death of his parents, the care and guidance of his little lordship fell to the lot of his grandmother, Lady Essington? No, it did not, replied Narkom. One might have supposed that it would, seeing that there was no paternal grandmother, but, well, the fact of the matter is, Cleek, that the late Lord Strathmere did not altogether approve of his mother-in-law's method of living. He was essentially a quiet, home-loving man, and had little patience with frivolity of any sort, and it occasioned no surprise among those who knew him when it was discovered that he had made a will leaving everything he possessed to his little son, and expressly stipulating that the care and upbringing of the boy were to be entrusted to his younger brother, the Honourable Felix Camour Paul Carruthers, who was to enjoy the revenue from the estate until the child attained his majority. "'I see, I see,' said Cleek appreciatively. "'Then that did her extravagant ladyship out of a pretty large and steady income for a matter of seventeen or eighteen years. Hmm, wise man, always, of course, provided that he didn't save the boy from the frying-pan only to drop him into the fire. What kind of a man is this brother, this Honourable Felix Carruthers, into whose hands he entrusted the future of his little son? I seem to have a hazy recollection of hearing that name somewhere or somehow, in connection with some other affair. Wise choice, was it, Mr. Narkom? "'Couldn't have been better, to my thinking. "'I know the Honourable Felix quite well. "'A steady-going, upright, honourable young fellow. "'He isn't over two or three-and-thirty, "'who, being a second son, "'naturally inherited his mother's fortune. "'And that being considerable, "'he really did not need the income from his little nephews "'in the slightest degree. "'However, he undertook the charge willingly, for he is much attached to the boy, and he and his wife, to whom he was but recently married, by the way, entered into residence at his late brother's splendid property, Boskydell Priory, just over on the other side of those hills. You can see from the window there, where they are at present entertaining a large house-party, among whom are Lady Essington and her son Claude. Ah, uh how? -huh. "'Then her ladyship has a son, has she? "'The daughter who died was not her only child.' "'No, the son was born about a year after the daughter. "'A nice lad, bright, clever, engaging, 
fond of all sorts of dumb animals birds monkeys white mice all manner of such things and as tender-hearted as a girl wouldn't hurt a fly carruthers is immensely fond of him and has him at the priory whenever he can that of course means having the mother too which is a bit of a trial in a way for i don't believe that her ladyship and mrs carruthers care very much for each other but that's another story now then let's see where was i oh ah, about the house party at the priory and carruthers fondness for the boy you can judge of my surprise my dear cleek when last night's post brought me a private letter from lady essington asking me to meet her here at this inn which by the way belongs to the strathmere estate and is run by a former servant at the priory and stating that she wished me to bring one of the shrewdest and cleverest of my detectives as she was quite convinced there was an underhand scheme afoot to injure his little lordship in short she had every reason to believe that somebody was secretly attacking the life of the golden boy she then went on to give me details of a most extraordinary and bewildering nature indeed what were those details mr narkom let her tell you for herself here she is replied the superintendent as a veiled and cloaked figure moved hurriedly past the window and he and cleek had barely more than pushed back their chairs and risen when that figure entered the room a sweep of her hand carried back her veil and cleek looking round saw what he considered one of the handsomest women he had ever beheld a good woman too for all her frivolous life and her dark ancestry if clear straight-looking eyes could be taken as a proof which he knew that they could not for he had seen men and women in his day as crafty as the fox and as dangerous as the serpent who could look you straight in the eyes and never flinch while others as true as steel and as clean-lifed as saints would send shifting glances flicking all round the room and could no more fix those glances on the face of the person to whom they were talking than they could take unto themselves wings and fly but good or ill whichever the future might prove this lovely lady to be one thing about her was certain she was violently agitated and nervousness was making her shake perceptibly and breathe hard like a spent runner it is good of you to come mr narkom she said moving forward with a grace which no amount of excitement could dispel or diminish the innate grace of the woman born to her station and schooled by mother nature's guiding hand i had hoped that i might steal away and come here to meet you unsuspected but secretly as i wrote carefully as i planned this thing i have every reason to believe that my efforts are suspected and that i have indeed been followed so then this interview must be a very hurried one and you must not be surprised if it becomes necessary for me to run off without a moment's notice for believe me i am quite quite sure that the honourable mr felix carruthers is already following me the honourable my dear lady essington you don't mean to suggest that he he of all men god bless my soul oh it may well amaze you mr narkom it well nigh stupefied me when i first began to suspect indeed i can't do any more than suspect even yet perhaps it is he perhaps that abominable woman he has married you must decide that when you have heard i perceive glancing over at cleek you have been unable to bring a detective police officer to listen to what i have to say but if you and your friend will listen carefully and convey the story to one in due course pardon your ladyship but my companion is a detective officer interposed narkom so if you will state the case at once he will be able to advise a detective you she flashed round on cleek and looked at him in amazement her lower lip indrawn a look almost of horror in her eyes 
one may not tell a lion that another lion is a jackass though he masquerade in the skin of one birth spoke to birth she saw she knew she understood by what process could such as you she began then stopped and made a slight inclination of the head pardon she continued that was rude your private affairs are of course your own mr uh, headland your ladyship supplied cleek my name is george headland and narkom knew from that that for all her grace and charm he neither liked nor trusted her soft-eyed ladyship thank you said lady essington accepting this self-introduction with a graceful inclination of the head no doubt mr narkom has given you some idea of my reason for consulting you mr headland but as time is very short let me give you the further details as briefly as possible i am convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that some one who has an interest in his death is secretly attacking the life of my little grandson and i have every reason to believe that the some one is either the honourable felix carruthers or his wife but to what purpose your ladyship people do not commit so desperate an act as murder without some powerful motive either of gain or revenge behind it and from what i have heard neither the uncle nor the aunt can have anything to win by injuring his little lordship can they not she answered with a despairing gesture how little you know mrs carruthers is an ambitious woman mr headland and like all women of the class from which she was recruited she aspires to a title she was formerly an actress the honourable felix married and took her from the theatre it is abominable that a person of that type should be foisted upon society and brought into contact with her betters oh ho oh, that's where the shoe pinches is it thought cleek but aloud he merely said the day has long passed your ladyship when the followers of thespis have to apologize for their existence there are many ladies of the stage in these times whose lives are exemplary and whose names call forth nothing but respect and admiration and so long as this particular lady bore an unblemished reputation did she oh yes there was never a word against her in that respect felix would never have married her if there had been but i believe in persons of that class remaining in their own circle and not intruding themselves into others to which they were not born she is an ambitious woman as i have told you she aspires to a title as well as to riches and if little lord strathmere should die her husband would inherit both surely that is motive enough for a woman of that type as for her husband there i am afraid your suspicion confounds itself your ladyship interrupted cleek i am told that the honourable mr carruthers is extremely fond of the boy besides which being rich in his own right he has no reason to covet the riches of his brother's baby son pardon me was rich is the proper expression not is mr headland the failure a fortnight or so ago of the west coast diamond mining company in which the greater part of his fortune was invested and of which he was the chairman has sadly crippled his resources and he has now nothing but the income from his nephew's estate to live upon hm ah just so said cleek pinching his chin now i recollect what made the name seem familiar mr narkom i remember reading of the failure and of the small hope that was held out of anything being saved from the wreckage still the income from the strathmere estate is enormous and by dint of care in the seventeen or eighteen years which must elapse before his little lordship comes of age he will never come of age he will be killed first he is being killed now 
interposed Lady Essington agitatedly. Oh, Mr. Headland, help me! I love the boy. He is my own child's child. I love him as I never loved anything else in all the world. And if he were to die, dear God, what should I do? And he is dying. I tell you he is and they won't let me go near him they won't let me have him all to myself these two if his cries in the night wring my heart and i run to his nursery one or the other of them is always there and never for one moment will they let me hold him in my arms nor be with him alone hm cries out in the night does he your ladyship what kind of cries those of fright or of pain of pain of excruciating pain it would wring the heart of a stone to hear him and though there is never a spot of blood nor a sign of violence he declares that some one comes in the night and sticks something into his neck something which in his baby way he likens to a long long needle that goes yight through my neck and sets other needles prickin and prickin all down my arm hello what's that let's have that again please rapped out cleek before he thought then recollected himself and added apologetically i beg your ladyship's pardon but i am apt to get a little excited at times something like a needle being run into his neck eh and other needles continuing the sensation down the arm hm had a doctor called in no i wished to but neither the uncle nor aunt would let me do so they say it is nothing a mere growing pain which he will overcome in time but it is not i know it is not if it were natural why did it never manifest itself before the failure of that wretched diamond company why did it wait to begin until after the honourable felix carruthers had lost his money and why is it going on night after night ever since why has he begun to fail in health to change from a happy laughing healthy child into a peevish fretful constantly complaining one i tell you they are killing him those two i tell you they are using some secret diabolical thing which is sapping his very life and if she stopped and sucked her breath in with a little gasp of fright and whisking down her veil turned and made hurriedly for the door i told you he guessed i told you i should be followed she said in a shaking voice he is coming that man along the road there look through the window and you will see oh come to my assistance mr headland find some way to do it for god's sake good-bye then the door opened and shut and she was gone darting out from the rear of the inn into the shelter of the scattered clumps of furze bushes and the thick growth of bracken which covered the downs and running like a hare pursued well what do you make of it old chap asked narkom anxiously turning to cleek after ascertaining past all doubt that the honourable felix carruthers was riding up the road toward the french horn oh a crime beyond doubt he replied but whose i am in no position to determine at present a hundred things might produce that stabbing sensation in the neck from the prick of a pinpoint dipped in curare to a smear of the pope's balm that hellish ointment of the borgias hm and so that's the honourable felix carruthers is it keep back from the window my friend when you are out gunning for birds it never does to raise an alarm and we should be hard put to it to explain our presence here at this particular time if he were to see you my dear chap you don't surely mean that you think he is really at the bottom of it began narkom in surprise but before he could say a word further that surprise was completely overwhelmed by another and a greater one for the honourable felix had reined in and dismounted at the french horn's door 
and with a clear voiced no don't put him up i shan't be long betty just want a word or two with some friends i'm expecting walked straightway into the bar parlour and advanced toward the superintendent with hand outstretched thank god you got my letter in time mr narkom he said with a breath of intense relief although i sent it by express messenger it was after three o'clock and i was afraid you wouldn't what a friend you are to come to my relief like this i shall owe you a debt no money can repay this then is the great and amazing cleek is it i thank you mr cleek i thank you from the bottom of my heart for accepting the case now we shall get to the bottom of the mystery i am sure it was upon the tip of narkom's tongue to inquire what he meant by all this but cleek rightly suspecting that the letter to which he alluded had been delivered at the yard after the superintendent's departure jumped into the breach and saved the situation very good of you indeed to place such great reliance in me mr carruthers he said we had to scramble for it mr narkom and i the letter was so late in arriving but thank fortune we managed to get here as you see and now please may i have the details of the case he spoke guardedly lest it should be upon some matter other than the interest of the golden boy and to prevent the honourable felix from guessing that he had already been approached upon that subject by lady essington it was not some other matter however it was again the mystery of the secret attacks upon his little lordship he was asked to dispel and the honourable felix plunging forthwith into the details connected with it gave him exactly the same report as lady essington had done come to the rescue mr cleek he finished rather excitedly both my wife and i feel that you and you alone are the man to get at the bottom of this diabolical thing and the boy is as dear to us as if he were our own help me to get proof unimpeachable proof of the hand which is engineering these diabolical attacks that we may not only put an end to them before they go too far but may avert the disgrace which publicity must inevitably bring publicity mr carruthers what publicity are you in dread of please that which could only bring shame to a dear lovable young fellow if any hint of what i believe to be the truth should get out mr cleek he replied to you i may confess it i appeal to no medical man because i fear for young claude's sake that investigation may lead to a discovery of the truth for both my wife and i feel indeed we almost know that it is his own grandmother lady essington who is injuring the boy and that it will not be long before she attempts to direct suspicion against us indeed for what purpose to have us removed by the courts as not being fit to have the care of the child and to get him transferred to her care that she may enjoy the revenue from his estate whew whistled cleek softly well done my lady we do our best to keep her from getting at him went on the honourable felix but she succeeds in spite of us his nursery was on the same floor as her rooms but for greater safety i last night had him carried to my own bedchamber and double locked all the windows and doors i said to myself that nothing could get to him then but it did just the same in the middle of the night he woke up screaming and crying out that someone had come and stuck a long needle in his neck and then for the first time god i nearly went off my head when i saw it for the first time mr cleek there was a mark upon him three red raw little spots just above the collarbone on the left side of the neck as if a bird had pecked him hmm and all the windows closed you say all but one the window of my dressing-room 
but as that is barred so that nobody could possibly get in i thought it did not matter and so left it partly open for the sake of air i see said cleek i see hmm a fortnight without any outward sign and then of a sudden three small raw spots indented in the centre are they and much inflamed about the edges thanks quite so quite so and the doors locked and all the windows but one closed and secured on the inside so that no human body what's that take the case certainly i will mr carruthers you are entertaining a house party at present i hear now if you can make it convenient to put me up in the priory for a night or two and will inform your guests that an old varsity friend named uh, let's see oh uh, deland that will do as well as any lieutenant arthur deland home on leave from india if you will inform your guests that that friend will join the house party to-morrow afternoon i'll be with you in time for lunch and will bring my man-servant with me thank you thank you said the honourable felix wringing his hand i'll do exactly as you suggest mr cleek and rooms shall be ready for you when you arrive and the matter being thus arranged the honourable felix took his departure and cleek calling the landlady to furnish him with pen ink and paper sat down then and there to write a private note to lady essington telling her to look out for mr george headland to put in an appearance at the priory in three days time End of section forty one forty two of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epilogue The Affair of the Man Who Was Found. Part two. It was exactly half past one o'clock when Lieutenant Arthur Deland, a big, handsome, fair haired, fair moustached fellow with the stamp of the army all over him turned up at boskydale priory with an undersized indian servant and an oversized kit and was presented to his hostess and to the several members of the house party by all of whom he was voted a decided acquisition before he had been an hour under the priory's roof it is odd how one's fancies sometimes go he found the honourable mrs carruthers a sweet gentle dove-like little woman for whom he did not care in the least degree and he found lady essington's son a rollicking bubbling overgrown boy of two-and-twenty whom in spite of frivolous upbringing and a rather pronounced brusqueness toward his mother he fancied very much indeed in fact he played right up to mr claude essington as our american cousins say and mr claude essington fancying him hugely took him to his heart forthwith and blurted out his sentiments with almost small boy candour i say to hand you're a spiffing sport i like you he said bluntly after they'd played one or two sets of tennis with the ladies and done their social duties generally if things look up a bit and i'm able to go back to oxford for the next term and the lord knows how i shall if the mater doesn't succeed in touching carruthers for some money for we're jolly near broke and up to our eyes in debt but if i do go back and you're in england still i'll have you up for the may week and give you the time of your life oh lord here's the mater coming now let's hook it come round to the stables will you and have a look at my collection pippin lord they'll interest you they did for on investigation the collection proved to be made up of pigeons magpies parakeets white mice monkeys and even a tame squirrel all of which came forth at their master's call and swarmed or flocked all over him now then dolly varden you keep your thieving tongs away from my scarf-pin old lady 
exclaimed this enthusiast to a magpie which perched upon his shoulder and immediately made a peck at the small pearl in his necktie. "'Awfullest old thief and vagrant that ever sprouted a feather, this beauty,' he explained to Cleek as he smoothed the magpie's head. "'Steal your eye teeth if she could get at them, and goes off on the loose like a blessed wandering gypsy. Lost her for three days and nights a couple of weeks ago, and the Lord knows where the old vagrant put in her time. What's that? The white stuff on her beak. Blessed if I know. Been pecking at a wall or something, I reckon. And, hello, there's Carruthers and his little lordship strolling about hand in hand. Let's go and have a word with them. Strathmere's amazingly fond of my mice and birds. With that he walked away with the mice and the monkeys and the squirrel clinging to him, and those of the birds that were not perched upon his shoulders or his hands, circling around his head with a flurry of moving wings. Cleek followed. A word in private with the Honourable Felix was accountable for his appearance in the grounds with the boy, and Cleek was anxious to get a good look at him without exciting any possible suspicion in Lady Essington's mind regarding the lieutenant's interest in him. He was a bonny little chap, this last Earl of Strathmere, with a head and face that might have done duty for one of Raphael's cherubim, and the big wonder-eyes that make baby faces so alluring. "'Strathmere, this is Lieutenant Deland, come all the way from India to visit us,' said the Honourable Felix, as Cleek went down on his knees and spoke to the boy, examining him carefully the while. "'Won't you tell him you are pleased to see him?' "'Pleased to see you,' said the boy, then broke into a shout of glee as he caught sight of young Essington with the animals and birds. "'Pity birdies! Pity mouses! Give! Give!' he exclaimed eagerly, stretching forth his little hands. "'Certainly! Which will you have, old chap? Magpie, parakeet, pigeon, monkey, or mice?' said young Essington gaily. "'Here, take the lot and be happy.' Then he made as if to bundle them all into the child's arms, and might have succeeded in doing so, but that Cleek rose up and came between them and the boy. "'Do have some sense, Essington,' he rapped out sharply. "'Those things may not bite nor claw you, but one can't be sure when they are handled by someone else. Besides, the boy is not well, and he ought not to be frightened.' "'Sorry, old chap. Always putting my foot into it. But Strathmere likes him, don't you, bonny boy? And I didn't think.' "'Take them back to the stables, and let's have a go at billiards for an hour or two before tea,' said Cleek, turning as Essington walked away, and looking after him with narrowed eyes and lips indrawn. When man and birds were out of sight, however, he made a sharp and sudden sound, and almost in a twinkling his Indian servant slipped into sight from behind a nearby hedge. "'Get round there and examine those birds after he's left them,' said Cleek in a swift whisper. "'There's one, a magpie, with something smeared on its beak. Find out what it is and bring me a sample. Look sharp.' "'Right you are, sir,' answered in excellent Cockney the undersized person addressed. "'I'll spread one of me famous tickled tootsies and nip in and catch the blooming orc as soon as the Joss's back is turned, governor.' "'I'm off,' as the squib said to the match when it started blowing of him up. Then the face disappeared again, and the child and the two men were again alone together. "'Good God, man!' exclaimed the Honourable Felix in a lowered voice of strong excitement. "'You can't possibly believe that he, that dear lovable boy, oh, it is beyond belief!' "'Nothing is beyond belief in my line, my friend.' "'Recollect that even Lucifer was an angel once. "'I know the means employed to bring about this,' "'touching softly the three red spots on his little lordship's neck. "'But I have yet to decide how the thing is administered and by whom. "'Frankly, I do not believe it is done with a bird's beak, "'though that too is possible, wild as it seems.' "'But by this time to-morrow I promise you the riddle shall be solved. "'Shh! Don't speak. He's coming back. 
take the boy into your own room to-night but leave the door unfastened i'm coming down to watch by him with you let him first be put into the regular nursery however then take him out without the knowledge of any living soul of any you hear and i will be with you before midnight that night two curious things happened the first was that at a quarter to seven when martha the nursemaid coming up into the nursery to put his little lordship to bed found lieutenant deland who was supposed to be dressing for dinner at the time standing in the middle of the room looking all about the place don't be startled nurse he said as he looked round and saw her your master has asked me to design a new decoration for this room and i'm having a peep about in quest of inspiration ah strathmere dustman's time i see pleasant dreams to you old chap see you in the morning when you're awake say good night to the gentleman your lordship said the nurse laying both hands on his shoulders and leading him forward whereupon he began to whine sleepily want sambo want sambo and to rub his fists into his eyes yes dearie nanny'll get sambo for your lordship after your lordship has said good night to the gentleman soothed the nurse and held him gently until he had done so good night old chap said cleek hello nurse got a sore finger have you eh how did that happen it looks painful it is sir though i can't for the life of me think whatever could have made a thing so bad from just scratching one's finger unless it could have happened that there was something poisonous on the wretched magpie's claws one never can be sure where those nasty things go nor what they dip into the magpie repeated cleek what do you mean by that nurse have you had an unpleasant experience with a magpie then yes sir that big one of mr essington's the nasty creature that's always flying about it was a fortnight ago sir mistress's pet dog had got into the nursery and laid hold of sambo which is his lordship's rag doll sir as he never will go to sleep without tore it well nigh to pieces did the dog and knowing how his lordship would cry and mourn if he saw it like that i fetched in my work-basket and started to mend it i just got it pulled into something like shape and was about to sew it up when i was called out of the room for a few minutes and when i came back there was that wretched magpie that had been missing for several days right inside my work-basket trying to steal my reels of cotton sir it had come in through the open window like it so often does nasty thing i loathe magpies and i believe that that one knows it anyway when i caught up a towel and began to flick at it to get it out of the room it turned on me and scratched or pecked my finger and it's been bad ever since cook says she thinks i must have touched it against something poisonous after the skin was broken maybe i did sir but i can't think what cleek made no comment merely turned on his heel and walked out of the room the second curious thing occurred between nine o'clock and half past when the gentlemen of the party were lingering at the table over postprandial liqueurs and cigars and the ladies had adjourned to the drawing-room a recollection of having carelessly left his kit-bag unlocked drew cleek to invent an excuse for leaving the room for a minute or two and sent him speeding up the stairs the gas in the upper halls had been lowered while the members of the household were below the passages were dim and shadowy and the thick carpet on halls and stairs gave forth never a murmur of sound from under his feet nor from under the feet of yet another person who had gone like he but by a different staircase to the floors above it was therefore only by the merest chance that he looked down one of the passages in passing and saw a swift moving figure a woman's cross it at the lower end and pass hastily into the nursery of the sleeping boy 
and whether her purpose was a good or an evil one, it was something of a shock to realise that the woman who was doing this was the Honourable Mrs. Carruthers. He locked the kit-bag and went back to the dining-room just as the little gathering was breaking up, and Mr. Claude Essington, who always fed his magpies and his other pets himself, was bewailing the fact that he had forgotten the beauties until this minute, and was smoothing out an old newspaper in which to wrap the scraps of cheese and meat he had sent the butler to the kitchen to procure. The Honourable Felix looked up at Cleek with a question in his eye. No, he contrived to whisper in reply. It was not anything poisonous, merely candle-wax. The bird had flown in through the storeroom window, and the housekeeper caught it carrying away candles one by one. The Honourable Felix made no response, nor would it have been heard had he done so, for just at that moment young Essington, whose eye had been caught by something in the paper, burst out into a loud guffaw. "'I say, this is rich. Listen here, you fellows. Lay you a tenor that the chap who wrote this was a paddywhack, for a finer bull never escaped from a tipperary paddock. Lost, somewhere between Portsmouth and London, or some other spot on the way. A small black leather bag containing a death certificate, and some other things of no value to anybody but the owner. Finder will be liberally rewarded if all contents are returned intact to DJ O apostrophe M, 425 Savile Row West. There's a beautiful example of English as she is advertised for you. And if Hello, Deland, old chap, what's the matter with you? For Cleek had suddenly jumped up, and catching the Honourable Felix by the shoulder was hurrying him out of the room. I just thought of something, that's all. It got to make a run. Be with you again before bedtime, he answered evasively. But once on the other side of the door, Write me down an ass, he quoted, turning to his host. No, don't ask any questions. Lend me your auto and your chauffeur. Call up both as quickly as possible. Wait up for me, and keep your wife and Lady Essington and her son waiting up too. I said to-morrow I would answer the riddle, did I not? Well, then, if I'm not the blindest bat that ever flew, I'll give you that answer to-night. Then he turned round and raced upstairs for his hat and coat, and ten minutes later was pelting off Londonward as fast as a thousand-pound panard could carry him. It was close to one o'clock when he came back and walked into the drawing-room of the Priory, accompanied by a sedate and bespectacled gentleman of undoubted Celtic origin, whom he introduced as... Dr. James O'Malley, ladies and gentlemen, M.D. Dublin. Lady Essington and her son acknowledged the introduction by an inclination of the head, the Honourable Felix and Mrs. Carruthers ditto. Then her ladyship's son spoke up in his usual blunt, outspoken way. "'I say, Deland, what's in the wind?' he asked. "'What lark are you up to now?' "'Felix says you've got a clinking big surprise for us all, "'and here we are, dear boy, all primed and ready for it. "'Let's have it, there's a good chap.' "'Very well, so you shall,' he replied. "'But first of all, let me lay aside a useless mask "'and acknowledge that I am not an Indian Army officer. "'I am a simple police detective, "'sometimes called George Headland, your ladyship.' and sometimes george headland she broke in sharply getting up and then sitting down again pale and shaken and you came you came after all oh thank you thank you i know you would not confess this unless you have succeeded oh you may know at last you may know she added turning upon the honourable felix and his wife i sent for him i brought him here 
i want to know and i will know whose hand it is that is striking at strathmere's life my child's child the dearest thing to me in all the world i don't care what i suffer i don't care what i lose i don't care if the courts award him to the veriest stranger so that his dear little life is spared and he is put beyond all danger for good and all real love shone in her face and eyes as she said this and it was the certainty of that which surprised carruthers and his wife as much as the words she spoke good heavens is this thing true the honourable felix turned to cleek as he spoke were you in her pay too was she also working for the salvation of the boy yes he made answer i entered into her service under the name of george headland mr carruthers the service of a good woman whom i misjudged far enough to give her a fictitious name i entered into yours by one to which i have a better right hamilton cleek Cleek. both her ladyship and her son were on their feet like a flash there was a breath of silence and then well i'm dashed blurted out young essington cleek eh the great cleek scotland and sat down again overcome yes cleek my friend cleek ladies and gentlemen all and now that the mask is off let me tell you a short little story which no pardon mr essington don't leave the room please i wish you too to hear wasn't going to leave it only going to shut the door ah i see allow me it is now ladies and gentlemen exactly fourteen days since our friend dr o'malley here coming up from portsmouth on his motorcycle after attending a patient who that day had died was overcome by the extreme heat and the exertion of trying to fight off a belligerent magpie which flew out of the woods and persistently attacked him and falling to the ground lost consciousness when he regained it he was in the charing cross hospital and all that he knew of his being there was that a motorist who had picked him and his cycle up on the road had carried him there and turned him over to the authorities he himself was unable however to place the exact locality in which he was travelling at the time of the accident otherwise we should not have had that extremely interesting advertisement which mr essington read out this evening for the doctor had lost a small black bag containing something extremely valuable which he was carrying at the time and which supplies the solution to this interesting riddle how do you ask come with me all of you to mr carruthers room where his little lordship is sleeping and learn that for yourselves they rose at his word and followed him upstairs and there in a dimly lit room the sleeping child lay with an old rag doll hugged up close to him its painted face resting in the curve of his little neck you want to know from where proceed these mysterious attacks who and what it is that harms the child said cleek as he went forward on tiptoe and gently withdrawing the doll held it up here it is then this is the culprit this thing here you want to know how then by this means look see he thrust the blade of a pocket-knife into the doll and with one sweep ripped it open and dipping in his fingers drew from the cotton wool and rags with which the thing was stuffed a slim close-stoppered glass vial in which something that glowed and gave off constant sparks of light shimmered and burnt with a restless fire is this it doctor he said holding the thing up yes oh my god yes he cried out as he clutched at it a wonder of the heavens sure that the child wasn't disfigured for life or perhaps killed for ever a half grain of it a half grain of radium ladies and gentlemen enough to burn a hole through the devil himself if he lay long enough again it 
Radium. 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 The word was voiced on every side, and the two women and two men crowded close to look at the thing. Radium in the doll? Radium? I'd say, Delant, I mean to say, Mr. Cleek, in God's name, who could have put the cursed thing there? Your magpie, Mr. Essington, replied Cleek, and with that brief preface told of Martha the nurse, and of the torn doll, and of the magpie that flew into the room while the girl was away. The wretched thing must have picked it up when the doctor fell and lost consciousness, and the open bag lay unguarded, he said. And with its propensity for stealing and hiding things, it flew with it into the nursery and hid it in the torn doll. Martha did not see it, of course, when she sewed the doll up, but the scratch she received from the magpie presented a raw surface to the action of the mineral, and its effect was instant and most violent. What's that? No, Mr. Carruthers, no one is guilty. No one has even tried to injure his lordship. Chance only is to blame, and chance cannot be punished. As for the rest, do me a favour, dear friend, in place of any other kind of reward. Look to it that this young chap here gets enough out of the income of the estate to continue his course at Oxford, and that's all. It was not, however, for while he was still speaking, a strange and even startling interruption occurred. A liveried servant, pushing the door open gently, stepped into the room bearing a small silver salver upon which a letter lay. "'Well, upon my word, Johnston, this is rather an original sort of performance, isn't it?' exclaimed Carruthers, indignant over the intrusion. "'I beg your pardon, sir, but I did knock,' he apologised. "'I knocked twice, in fact, but no one seemed to hear, and as I had been told it was a matter of more than life and death, I presumed. Letter for Lieutenant Deland, sir. A gentleman of the name of Narkom, in a motor, sir, at the door, asked me to deliver it at once, and under any and all circumstances. Cleek looked at the letter, saw that it was enclosed in a plain, unaddressed envelope, asked to be excused, and stepped out into the passage with it. That Narkom should have come for him like this, should have risked the upsetting of a case by appearing before he knew if it was settled, or indeed likely to be, could mean but one thing, that his errand was one of overwhelming importance, of more moment than anything else in the world. He tore off the envelope with hands that shook, and spread open the sheet of paper it contained. There was but one single line upon it, but that line, penned in that hand, would have called him from the world's end. "'Come to me at once, Ailsa,' he read, and was on his way downstairs like a shot. In the lower hall the butler stood, holding his hat and coat ready for him to jump into them at once. "'My uh, young servant, quick as you can,' said Cleek, grabbing the hat and hurrying into the coat. "'Already outside, sir, in the motor with the gentleman,' the butler gave back then opened the door and stepped aside, holding it back for him and bowing deferentially. And the light of the hall, streaking out into the night, showed a flight of shallow steps, the blue limousine at the foot of them, with Leonard in the driver's seat and Dollops beside him, and standing on the lowest step of all, Mr. Narkom holding open the car's door and looking curiously pale and solemn. "'What is it? Is she hurt? Has anything happened to her?' Cleek jumbled the three questions into one unbroken breath as he came running down the steps and caught at the superintendent's arm. "'Speak up! Don't stand looking at me like a dumb thing! Is anything wrong with Miss Lorne?' "'Nothing. Nothing at all.' "'Thank God! Then why? Why? For what reason has she sent for me? Where is she? Speak up!' "'In town, waiting for you, at the Mauravanian Embassy.' "'At the... 
good god how comes she to be there i took her you told me if anything happened to you that i thought she ought to know please get in and let us be off sir sire whichever it ought to be i don't know the proper form of address i've never had any personal dealings with royalty before the hand that rested on his arm tightened its grip the very instant that word royalty passed his lips now it relaxed suddenly dropped away and he scarcely recognized the voice that spoke next so unlike to cleek's it was so thick was the tremulous note that pulsated through it royalty it repeated speak up please what have you found out what do you know of me that you make use of that term what everybody in the world will know by tomorrow count irma has told count irma has come as the special envoy of the people for queen karma's son for the king they want for you flung out narkom getting excited as he proceeded it's all out at last and i know now everybody does i'm to lose you mauravania is to take you from me after all a palace is to have you not the yard get in please sir sir your majesty get in they're waiting for you at the embassy get in and go good luck to you god bless you i mean that it's just about going to break my heart cleek but i mean it every word mind the step sir make room for me on the seat there you two and then off to the embassy as fast as you can streak it leonard his majesty is all ready to start not yet please a voice said quietly then a hand reached out from the interior of the limousine dropped upon mr narkom's shoulder and tightening there drew him over the step and into the car your old seat my friend here beside me my memory is not a short one and my affections not fickle all right now leonard let her go then the door closed with a smack the limousine came round with a swing and just as in those other days when it was the law that called not the trumpet peal from a throne the car went bounding off at the good old mile a minute clip on its flyaway race for london it ended that race in front of the mauravanian embassy and cleek's love for the spectacular must have come near to being surfeited that night for the building was one blaze of light one glamour of flags and flowers and festooned bunting and looking up the steps down which a crimson carpet ran across the pavement to the very curbstone he could see a double line of soldiers in the glittering white and silver of the mauravanian royal guard plumed and helmeted standing with swords at salute waiting to receive him and over the arched doorway the royal arms emblazoned and above them picked out in winking gas jets a wreath of laurel surrounding the monogram m r which stood for maximilian rex a flame against a marble background here we are at last sir said narkom as the car stopped he had learned by this time that sire belonged to the stage in the middle ages and alighting held back the door that cleek might get out afterward he declared that that was the proudest moment of his life for if it was not the proudest of cleek's his looks belied him for as his foot touched the crimson carpet a band within swung into the stately measure of the mauravanian national anthem an escort came down the hall and down the steps and lined up on either side of him and if ever man looked proud of his inheritance that man was he 
he went on up the steps and down the long hall with a chorus of vivat maximilian vivat le roi following him and the sound of the national anthem ringing in his ears then all of a moment the escort fell back doors opened he found himself in a room that blazed with lights that echoed with the sound of many vivats the stir of many bodies and looking about saw that he was surrounded by a kneeling gathering and that one man in particular was at his feet sobbing he looked down and saw that that man was irma and smiled and put out his hand the count bent over and touched it with his lips majesty i never forgot majesty i worked for it fought for it ever since that night he said i would have fought for it ever if it need have been but it was not see it was not it was god's will and it was our people's my people's cleek repeated his head going back his eyes lighting with a pride and a happiness beyond all telling oh mauravania dear land dear country mine again but hardly had the ecstasy of that thought laid its spell upon him when there came another not less divine and his eyes went round the gathering in quest of one who should be here at his side to share this glorious moment with him she had come for that purpose narkom had said so where was she then why did she hold herself in the background at such a time as this he saw her at that very moment the gathering had risen and she with them holding aloof at the far end of the room there was a smile on her lips but even at that distance he could see that she was very very pale and that there was a shadow of pain in her dear eyes we both have battled for an ideal count he said with a happy little laugh here is mine here is what i have fought for and crossing the room he went straight to ailsa with both hands outstretched to her and his face fairly beaming. But it needed not the little shocked breath he heard upon all sides to dash that bright look from his face and to bring him to a sudden halt, for at his coming Ailsa had dropped the deep curtsy which is the due of royalty and was moving away from him backward, which is royalty's due also. Ailsa! he said moving toward her with a sharp and sudden step ailsa don't be absurd it is too silly to think that form should stand with you too take my hand take it your majesty take it i tell you he repeated almost roughly good god do you think that this can make any difference take my hand do you hear she obeyed him this time but as her fingers rested upon his he saw that they were quite ringless that the sign of their engagement had been removed and caught her to him with a passionate sort of fierceness that was a reproach in itself could you think so meanly of me could you he cried where is the ring in my pocket i took it off when i heard put it on again or no give it to me and let me do that myself here before them all kings must have queens must they not you were always mine you are always going to be even the day of our wedding is not to be changed oh hush she made answer one's duty to one's country must always stand first with kings must it kings after all are only men and a man's first duty is to the one woman of his heart not with kings there is a different rule a different law oh let me go please i know i fully realize it would be different with you if it were possible but it is the penalty one must pay for kingship dear 
royalty must mate with royalty not with a woman of the people it is the law of all kingdoms the immutable law it was he had forgotten that and it came upon him now with a shock of bitter recollection for a moment he stood silent the colour draining out of his face the light fading slowly from his eyes then of a sudden he looked over the glittering room and across its breadth at irma it would not be possible then he asked not as a royal consort sir the people's choice in that respect would lie with the hereditary princess of danubia i have already explained that to mademoiselle but if it should be your majesty's pleasure to take a morganatic wife cut that rapped in cleek's voice like the snap of a whiplash so then one is to sell one's honour for a crown break a woman's life for a kingdom and become a royal adulterer for the sake of a throne and sceptre but majesty one's duty to one's country is a sacred thing not so sacred as one's redeemer count and under god here is mine he threw back heatedly mauravania forgot once she will forget again she must forget my lords and gentlemen i decline her flattering offer my only kingdom is here in this dear woman's arms walk with me ailsa walk with me always you said you would walk with me dear as my queen and my wife and putting his arm about her and holding her close and setting his back to the lights and the flags and the glittering guard he passed with head erect through the murmuring gathering and went down and out with her to the blue limousine to the yard service again and to those better things which are the true crown of a man's life at the foot of the steps narkom and dollops caught up with him and the boy's eager hand plucked at his sleeve governor gold love you gold love you sir you're a man you are he said with a sort of sob in his voice i'm glad you chucked it it was breaking my heart to think that i'd have to call you sire all the rest of my day sir like as if you was a blooming horse End of Cleek of Scotland Yard by Thomas W. Hanshu. Recorded for LibriVox by Ruth Golding, 2013.